restore it. That's right. I had to go on and not know it for time's sake. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. It, makes it, up. It, it originally started in civil society, but was quickly taken over, especially in societies where there had been tremendous injustice, such as South Africa. And, and there it became a very uh, uh, significant uh, aspect of the need to uh, restore the justice that had been uh, so totally destroyed in our time, etc. And you might recall that the Truth and Reconciliation Committees were there, and I mean, that in itself was a bit uh, uh, controversial. Uh, that, you know, they, they were, but again, they were faced with the fact, how can we get uh, a more just society? And uh, they said that if anyone came up, either uh, who was a part of the government or a part of the uh, liberation movement, uh, admitted the fact that they committed crimes, they could go free. And uh, that, uh, for example, the relatives of Steve Beagle, Steve Beagle was the, uh, the uh, uh, colored man. For 
example, there are two couples in the United States. Uh, the one is the head of the, of the National Family Planning Movement in Wisconsin, and the second is the head of the Age in Country. Now, and that's pretty true about all of this around the world, too, that they are people who work for uh, the, the organization, so to speak. Yeah? And if, you know, I don't have to talk much about change, to be honest with you. But that, 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 that's my, uh, so that's the structure of the city. Also, the, the role of the city is to be advisory to the uh, that, uh, uh, so the city that have been held up to now have been advisory. Although, interestingly enough, up to 1974, they wrote their own document. But after 1974, their advice was to give their thoughts to the Pope, and the Pope would write the document. Well, you know, that might not be the best uh, way of going about the situation. Uh, and uh, that, uh, uh, and, and it's interesting, even at the time uh, of the Vatican Council, what the Second Vatican Council in the 60s did was to renew in the Roman Church the emphasis on Cody Jam. There's the College of Bishops, uh, still a move for lay people, but at least there's a College of Bishops. Huh? And that uh, together with the Pope, they have solicitude for the whole church. Many people at the time were hoping that there would be a, like the council that the synod would sort of continue this work over time. But Paul VI, the Pope on his own, established the synod, but said it was just advice. Now, one good thing that's happening at the present time, again, I prejudice judgment, but the previous civics have all been raped. And, uh, but this one, the movement said he wants people to speak freely, and I think you're beginning to have that, at least from what you can pick up. Since again, they're not allowing anybody to cover That's another problem. Okay, that, that's the citadel structure. Now, what's going on now? Well, I, I think, first of all, no one is calling for any change in teaching. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, and I, I'll say, I have problems with that, but they're not doing it now. Part of that might be a, a political thing, you know, you say, oh, we're not going to change the teaching, we're just going to change old pastoral practice. And, all right, it could be a political strategy, but the very fact that no one is saying, we got to change these teachings. Positive effects. 
frankly, parts of the document, if I had to bring this out, I think are excellent. Uh, there's one phrase that I just thought was or sentence that I thought was magnificent. And it says this, the truth is incarnate in human fragility, not to condemn it, but to cure it. Great, great sentence. The truth is incarnate. So it's not this truth out there that everybody has to no. know. But the truth is incarnate in human fragility, not to condemn it, but to cure it. Now, I, I think, you know, that's a marvelous way of dealing with sort of the, the goal and the ideals and the reality of the Christian life for all of us. Huh? But what effective and ultimately have, I don't know, but I, I think it's an excellent, uh, an, an, an excellent statement. So, in, in fairness, perhaps this uh, thing about talking about pastoral change in the long run might bring about doctrinal change. You know, it might be the, uh, the camel's nose in the tent. Not sure of that, uh, but at least there's, there's, there's a hope that maybe that could move in that direction. Now, basically, my problems in my religion, well, obviously, the Senate should be more than advisor, uh, that it should have you know, authority in the, in the church to set policy. But the problem with bringing about change, in order for the Catholic Church to change any of its moral it has to admit that past papal teaching that they said were divine or natural law has been wrong. That is a very tough thing for them to do. Huh? I mean, they, uh, you know, people say, well, the Catholic Church changed on kind of gay marriage. They say, well, they haven't changed in almost 50 years on artificial contraception for spouses. How do you think they're ever going to change on? I, I'm gay marriage. And I, mean, I think that's, that's the truth. Now, uh, that, uh, you know, maybe I'm too pessimistic, maybe I've been fighting too long, but uh, if you're never going to get change in teaching until you can admit that past teaching was wrong. Yeah? It, it reminds me, after the uh, papal encyclical on artificial contraception in 1968, the parameters were Robert McAfee Brown, a great Presbyterian theologian who was then teaching at Stanford, started an article, when and not if the Roman Catholic Church changes its teaching on contraception. The uh, encyclical will start out as the Holy Roman Catholic Church has always and everywhere taught. Uh, now, I think it shows the problem. So, I probably want to have to So, uh, it happened a few weeks ago, I was reading Michael Sandel's book, Just and Justice. I think he might have said much of what he said, but he would have been talking about Christianity. Right. So what's the difference between what Sandel says about justice and what Christianity has to say about justice? I, I don't think there are a the difference, right? You know, Sandel's book was the course he taught to Harvard undergraduate. 800 people at Saunders Theater there, uh, uh, and it was a splendid course. Uh, and then the book, the book came out. I, uh, that's why I said long ago some of these things that were said by Arsenal. In other words, that if, if you look at the way I tried to build my uh, uh, approach, it was to say you have to start with the notion that we are a political community. But then, it, you know, is exactly where the Greeks are. Um, they had their problems too, but, but, but you know, in, in fact, Aristotle said the highest vocation, you can use that word, the highest vocation that anybody can have in this world is to be a politician. When was the last time you heard that? <laughs> I mean, used car salesperson are better off the politicians in the public mind than they have. But Aristotle, you see, even the word politics comes from the Greek word for city, for cause. And therefore, if, in order for people to be happy, you need a just and good cause. And that 
that's what the Father Nation does. And so it's the concern for the good of the community. And as I say, I don't think you have to be Christian or Jewish in order to have it. Now that's a no, basically. Uh, but both of them have to fight against that huge tendency toward individualism. Okay? Jerry. Yes, you uh, address the item of the distribution of bearing the burden of society. And the argument is frequently been that progressive taxes will reduce the incentive for people with the other upper levels. Please share, and I'd like your, your reaction. Forty years ago, we took students to Scandinavia. And in Sweden, an economist uh, recognized our progressive taxes and said, we have discovered that the upper levels can have 100% tax whenever they are born, and it does not present a disincentive because they're motivated by different types of reasons than to earn more money. How can we get that across to this country? All right. Uh, I have no easy answers. A uh, couple of things I'll, uh, to say. Uh, first of all, I mean, 100% would be uh, uh, punitive. So I don't think anybody is calling for 100%. Uh, although one time in this country it was as high as 70%. And uh, that I, I still think that uh, On the other hand, what bothers me is even Sweden has gone to the right in the last election. Huh? And that uh, they are trying to cut back on some of the social benefits for everybody. Now, all that does is it shows, I think, that the, the danger of our American individualism and, and financial success is going all over the world. And again, uh, that, that uh, I mean, one, one thing, I, I, I teach a course on some of these things, and that a lot of the students come from the business school. And we have interesting discussions, to say the least. But ultimately, what I try to get them to say is, what makes you happy? Does money make you happy? And most of them, after a while, will say, no, that doesn't do it. You know, you need love, you need friendship, you need beauty, you need so many other things. Huh? And I think if we can at least, I mean, there's no easy answers to your, to your question, which is a fine question. But I think if we can, you know, even get people like that to see that, uh, you know, that's right, money doesn't make people happy. I mean, look at all the people you see in the world who have all sorts of money who aren't happy. Huh? And, and if we can just get, you know, try to get that message out. Now, I, I granted it's an uphill battle, but at least it's the one thing that I have tried in my own course to do, is to get people to see. And, and most of us say, well, ultimately realize that fact, you know, that it doesn't have to happen. Now, and, and there again, there's Aristotle who said you got to the sufficiency of this world's goods. At the end, that's a minimally decent human existence. And I, but I, I think that that might be one way of just getting people away from that. That is, because I think, again, if you have people thinking, I don't know, 85% of people in this country would admit that money doesn't make it happen. Um, I'm There's a lot of, uh, this whole culture of individualism is just pure hypocrisy. I don't see any individualism for sexual and gender minorities. I don't see any individualism for indigenous Americans. I don't see any individualism for Spanish or their language and culture. I don't see any individualism for African Americans saying the right to exist is exemplified by seven shootings of unarmed mm -hmm. people or their hair texture. And all this talk of individualism really is just you, you must be, and red thing, and uh, it, it really means that only the uh, white male descendants of uh, thugs who 
and 